This story has been recorded at an Addictive Eaters Anonymous meeting in New Zealand. You can email us at contact at aeanz.org. And because tonight is the first Friday night in the month, um, we have a speakers meeting and tonight the speaker is Louise. Thanks Di. I'm Louise, I'm an addictive eater. Hi Hi, Louise. Louise. (coughs) Yeah, well it's certainly a privilege to be able to be here as someone, um, you know, for whom this program has worked. And uh, I guess, I guess I'm aware that there's a lot of people um, out there who would, you know, be transformed by this fellowship, and you know, to be to be here is, you know, just such a. Um, I don't know. It's not luck. I don't know what it is, but um, you know, I I hope I never lose sight of um, how good it is to be able to be sober today. Now I suppose I've been thinking a bit about my story and you know how to tell my story in a way that's not all about me but is about yeah to talk about me but not talk about me. I said God help me to do that but I don't know I think I'll have to mention myself at some point. <laughs> but, um, but you know to for the focus to be you know that that miracle of recovery and, and you know the, the power of the steps etc rather than just you know talking about myself but I mean you know I suppose when I first became aware of the disease in myself it was it was that awareness of being different different to others and it was definitely that um, incredible self-consciousness um, which was called being shy back then, but of course it was it was just extreme self consciousness. Um, and coupled with that was um, extreme self loathing, and a negative voice in my head that talked to me a lot about um, my failings. And so. Being at school, which was sort of where I was, I guess, when I became aware of this difference, that's when it mostly became obvious, was being around people. Seeing myself, you know, as this social cripple and and unable to sort of connect with people and didn't know what to say and didn't know how to say things and didn't know how to be a friend and didn't know what you talked about and, um, you know, excessively focused on what people thought of me and what they thought of the shoes I was wearing and what they thought of the clothes I had on and what they thought of everything. It was just this constant inner dialogue that just sort of went round and round. (coughs) So that was a pretty um, miserable sort of existence and I suppose, you know, the things that would stand out, the things that stood out for me as being something wonderful in my life was um, the food Um, and being a Catholic back then which brought me sort of a lot of joy, all the sort of paraphernalia around Catholicism. I loved the rosary beads and the, the nuns and the stained glass windows and the smell of the incense and the pews and the, you know, I, I wasn't so much into the church service or anything like that, but I just loved the, I loved the yeah. something of it, you know, and, and, and in that was a sort of, there was something, something, you know, that sort of brought me some sort of happiness. And of course the other thing that was a, delivered me from the misery was you know, if I could get my hands on food. And uh, I was thinking about, like, it was a party I went to where I would have been absolutely unable to talk to anybody and it would have been terrible. 
but I remember on the table very clearly this plate with these um, meringues and whoever had made the meringues hadn't sort of made them stiff enough and they'd all sort of gone out so they were the size of sort of bread and butter plates and they'd got two and <laughs> stuck them together with cream. Oh my God. And I might have had two. I might have even got away with three. I don't know. But I just remember the bliss, the bliss of the sweetness and the creaminess and the, you know, suddenly everything was all right. Everything was all right. It was like, I don't know. Yeah, it, it certainly did something for me. And so at home, the food wasn't really readily available, so it was, you know, eating the dried spaghetti noodles out of the packet, and it was drinking the Andrew's Health salts, and it was mixing up the butter and the sugar and a bit of cocoa, and sort of making like icing, eating the icing. Um, you know, anything would do, anything would do. Just wanting, you know, it was never enough. You know, mum, what mum put on the plate was never enough. It just was never enough. So by the time I was 16, I had a friend who sort of, it was a bit of a rebel as well. I, I was a, in the rebellion phase at that point, and her and I used to wag school, and that's when the smoking, the drinking, a little bit of drugs, um, the men, the driving around in the car, they don't really men, they were boys, driving around in cars with boys, you know, snogging boys, all that sort of thing, and she taught me how to eat and vomit, so it was like, oh, I thought that was sort of pretty cool. I wasn't terribly good at it, I wasn't terribly good at it, but, you know, I tried pretty hard at it. But I was kind of like on a bit of a road to nowhere, and I suppose by the time I was in my early 20s, I found myself in Wellington, living with my boyfriend in my first job that I'd somehow managed to get, I don't know how. And I'd been less and less successful at the vomiting and was becoming fatter and fatter. And I was living with my boyfriend and I was cooking and baking all the time. The lasagnas with the orange fat, the, you know, the cakes, the banana cakes, the lemon icing, the cream cheese icing, it was all, you know, I was just, I couldn't stop with the constant, constant baking, and of course I was getting bigger and bigger, and that's, I think, when I hit the biggest I ever was in my life. And so I'd go to bed at night, and I'd sit on the side of the bed, and I'd look down at my fat thighs, and I would absolutely hate my fat thighs, and I'd slap my fat thighs, and I'd be crying, you know, you know, hating myself, and I'd slap myself across the head a couple of times, and, you know, that's it, never again, I am never, ever eating anything like that ever again. Tomorrow is going to be salads, fruit, and water, and I'm going to lose all this weight, and I'm going to be thin, and it's going to be fantastic. And, by the way, God, I'm so sorry for all my sins. I'm such a bad person. And weep, 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 weep. And <laughs> so miserable. Everything terrible. And, you know, by the next morning, that miserable person was gone. And I couldn't wait to eat. And I'd be just back into it. Back into the eating. And it just went round and round and round. And that was, that was awful. So I ended up going overseas and um, in my mid-twenties kind of finding a um, health food boyfriend, my English boyfriend who was very, very into health food and finding my sort of spiritual guru. And so, oh, you know, my life seemed to be taking a bit of a turn into a more enlightened sort of phase. And so this health food boyfriend um, had a lot of very strong ideas, so next thing we were fasting, um, we were eating raw food, we were only shopping in the organic food shop, we were um, taking vitamins, um, we were just doing all, had all these kind of weird ideas about food and it was like, oh this is great, you know, this is wonderful and you know, I lost a bit of weight and was sort of like thinking, oh I'm, I'm all fixed, I'm normal now, but then when the health food boyfriend was at work, I was down at the supermarket buying the binges and I got back again into the binging and the vomiting sort of big time. 
And I really noticed, I suppose, the sort of the toll it took on me as a person as well, because this poor man would arrive home and I would have been eating and binging, um, binging and vomiting, and he'd walk in the door and I'd be all glassy eyed and sort of, you know, feeling terrible and on a real emotional lag and you know, wanting to row with him and pick holes in him because he wasn't good enough and what a lousy boyfriend and if he was, you know, better and, you know, more amazing and wonderful, our well, lives would be much better and I'd be blame, blame, blame. And, and but on the other hand, he he and the therapist I started going to um, were part of the sort of spiritual fellowship and um, I ended up being a member of the spiritual fellowship and being introduced to the idea of a higher power. Um, and so that, you know, harked me back to the days of Catholicism where there was that thing in me that was like, oh, yeah, there's something more, there's something more, there's something deeper. And it's sort of on that level, you know, that felt really lovely. But, you know, I just still had this terrible, mad and unhappy life going on. Um, my moods were very, very up and down. I mean, you know, the self-centeredness was just worse and worse as I walked along the street. I'd be looking in the shop windows at myself, what I'm wearing, was my stomach sticking out, how did my hair look? Oh my God, I'm so ugly. Um, you know, disliking other women that I met because they were prettier or thinner or had better boyfriends or seemed happier. And um, yeah, so I was just getting worse and worse basically in the disease. Came back to New Zealand, um, had a child, ended up here in Christchurch with my child. Uh, I'd gotten much more into drugs when I'd come back to New Zealand. Low level drugs, you know, marijuana, not, not anything heavy really. A little bit of acid I suppose, but um, you know, I liked drugs. Um, but yeah, still very much in, you know, at odds with everyone else in existence, very much preoccupied with myself, still very full of self-hatred and, and very, very resentful. Had developed a huge resentment against my mother and father. They hadn't loved me enough and if they had loved me more and hugged me more and been more supportive and encouraging, I would have been having a marvellous life by this stage. <laughs> so, you know, they had a lot to answer for. So anyway, I had my baby, I was living with my, the alcoholic father of my baby, um, I was in a job that I could hardly think, I could hardly act, I could hardly do the job, I seemed to have headaches and a, like a fog in my head all the time, I was taking Panadol <coughs> for hourly to clear a little sort of window so I could actually sort of see in front of me. And I, I just really recognised that I was just never ever going to get better, never going to grow out of it, never going to grow up, never going to get on with people. You know, I, uh, it was never going to happen, I was never going to be fixed. It was all sort of over rover and you know, I kind of came to that point. And not long after that I saw the library display for the Food Fellowship and Strangely enough, because I'd given up, I thought, I'd given up on God as well, you know, I'd given up on my spiritual fellowship, I'd loved the whole sort of spirituality thing, but my life was so mad, I just knew that I couldn't do it any justice, so I gave up on God. Um, so I was surprised that I wanted to come to a, a meeting, of, you know, in the fellowship, um, because I'd sort of given up on any answers being around, but anyway, I thought, oh yeah, that food thing, I've still got that food thing on the go, still binging, still vomiting, crawling around in the garden after meals, you know, vomiting, trying to pretend, go back inside, trying to pretend that I could parent my child and be a partner. And um, So I thought, oh, you know, maybe I'll go to that therapy group and uh, tell them about mum and how she, you know, never fed us enough and, you know, that's why I've got a food thing now. And So, you know, I came along and, you know, to my surprise, nobody was telling their sad, sad story and nobody was blaming their parents and nobody was crying. 
And nobody seemed to want to know my sad story. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all a bit it was all a bit different. And you know, for a start I thought it was all a bit ordinary because nobody was wearing robes or there was no one chanting Hare Krishna or you know, where was the spirituality? It just seemed like ordinary Christchurch people, you know. <laughs> but um, I knew, I knew it was like that step one, two and three had sort of almost already happened to me, you know. I came in, I had given up trying to control the food. I knew that I couldn't stop however much I tried. I had no control over the food. I couldn't stop buying the binges. I, I couldn't stop, once I'd started eating the binge, I couldn't stop getting the binges back out of the rubbish after I'd had the binge and decided I was never going to eat again, I couldn't stop. So, you know, I, I knew I had no control, I, I knew I was powerless, and I also knew I had tried everything and, and nothing was going to work. And so I was actually kind of ready to turn my life and my will over to somebody other than me. So I kind of came in sort of on my knees already in that area. So, you know, I got myself a sponsor and I kept on coming and, um, you know, my sponsor took me through the steps and, you know, it, it was hard, it was hard because I still had a, an obsession with the food. I wasn't, I wasn't eating, you know, that was a total miracle, I wasn't eating. Um, by the grace of God, I was, you know, able to stick with a food plan I had been given, so I wasn't eating, but I was still intensely mad in the head, um, and my self-will was extremely um, strong. So, you know, my sponsor took me through the steps, and I was coming, and I was sitting on the seat, and I was listening, and I was identifying, and I was, you know, starting to, once I, you know, did step four and five, I really, you know, was really starting to see that actually it wasn't mum and dad. Um, in fact, you know, I, I've got this disease of addiction. I am an addict. I'm bodily and mentally different to my fellows. And the way I had behaved in the world went 90% towards the way people had reacted to me and I started to see that, you know, it wasn't everyone else's fault that, you know, me being an addict had, you know, created a lot of, a lot of the misery in my life. You know, then I went on and, and you know, did, made my amends and that was very, very painful going back to people and admitting that I had stolen things and that I had told lies and, um, you know, the, the shame, the embarrassment of that was, it was acute, it was acute. Um, but, you know, I did that because, you know, A, I had absolutely nowhere else I could go, and B, you know, I wasn't eating, so although my life was still hard, you know, I had some freedom from the food and I knew I had to just keep going forward. So, you know, I, I got to, you know, that step 11 and got to sort of that conscious contact with my higher power. I got to resume that relationship with God that I thought was done and dusted. And this time, instead of asking God to help me and make this happen for me and do this for me and, um, you know, arrange life as I would like it, you know, I really started to see that, in fact, you know, the only thing I really could do was to just, um, you know, ask for God's will for, you know, God's will for me. And I started to want that, you know, I started to just want to be as God would have me be. You know, as, as I became less self-centred and that burden of self became less, you know, it became more clear that, you know, the joy of life and the joy of living was about you know, do, you know, living as God would have me live and doing, you know, what God would have me do. It was, you know, a surrendered life, a surrendered life. And so, you know, getting to that point took a matter of years, you know, that wasn't months, you know, that was years to get to that point of, 
of you know that really knowing that you know that yes you know, yes I want you know I want a a God life I want to live a life of usefulness that sane and happy usefulness and you know step twelve that you know that that service to others I think I've still got a long way to go in that area because I still think that my natural inclination is still to have fear around people and to uh, not be somebody who naturally is out there telling everyone about, you know, wow, this fantastic fellowship, although that is absolutely what I feel. So, you know, to me it's really having to go against my sort of grain a little bit. But, the, you know, I, I serve in the ways that I, you know, I serve. And, you know, I've been thinking a bit about this whole thing that we are all like a cell in the great body of the fellowship, and each cell in the body has like a slightly different function, and, you know, I, I, I contribute to the whole, contribute to the body, you know, as, as best I can, you know, with, with the gifts and, and the person that, you know, God has given me. And so recently, you know, our fellowship has become more global and, you know, it's just so incredible that there are these people now around the world who, you know, have the same freedom from the food and this, you know, who are working this same program and who, you know, have that same desire to, to serve, you know, God and, and their fellows that I do. And, you know, at first I didn't embrace that. I had this kind of fear of these others, you know, these other people from afar and who were they and, you know, I, I only know my little fellowship and, you know, there's these strangers and, you know, but, you know, I guess as I get more well, I have more capacity to be more open and more able to, yeah, embrace you know, the, the widening of who we are and, and the blossoming of who we are. So, yeah, it's, it's an incredible fellowship and amazing place. Thanks, guys.